Well, thank you, and thanks to Kirk. Uh, could anyone be more handsome than that guy? I just, just, I, just I have to say that. So, uh, um, so well, uh, four o'clock Monday lecture American founding. I don't know. Uh, reminds me of a little experience I had with my kids the other day. So it's President's Day, you know, uh, holiday, and I'm thinking, you know, I got one of these 24 hours a day, seven day a week jobs. I got to make sure first things first, and I had a thousand things honking at me, but I thought, no, I'm going to take a day with my family, so I set up a snowmobiling trip. I thought, no, oh, that'll be cool, you know, not the kind of thing you do every day, at least my family. So uh, make arrangements, rent some sleds, uh, uh, get the family up. Uh, early to head out on the road and just really patting myself on the back about what a good man I am. <laughs> Taking care of my people, you know, sacrificing my uh, professional ambitions to really put family first. And as I'm sitting there in the car as the kids are loading up and I'm kind of checking my phone and I check my Twitter account. I do tweet, by the way. It took me a while to learn that you, that's the word, is that you tweet, uh, that you don't Twitter. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I see a tweet from my son, my 16-year-old son, that goes something like this, posted that morning. If you're awake right now, your President's Day is off to a crappy start, too. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, so. Uh, it's not, you're not starting today, you're ending away, but I can think of better ways to end your day uh, here at uh, UVU. So, uh, but I'm happy to be here. Uh, and you definitely are a great end of my day uh, after things I've been dealing with, some of which Kirk has alluded to, we're still working on. <laughs> uh, so, but that's all part of the fun life of a university president. So what I want to do today is I've been invited to come and say something about uh, leadership and I think a number of you were probably, uh, we need a, on the, on the film, well, let's take her off mute. So, was there another lapel? Do I just need to project more? <laughs> I can do that. I'll just talk louder. Can everyone hear okay? Okay. And uh, maybe I'll sing as well. Just, uh, uh, okay. So uh, I think a number of you may have been in a, a setting recently with me where we talked about leadership core competencies. Any of you? Does that, did we do that with this group? Didn't we do that with this group, Kirk? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty memorable, apparently. <laughs> So I'm glad we did that, and that it was really moved you and changed your life. So, uh, Those core competencies are things that we've worked on as an institution. Uh, it kind of started as an executive level uh, operation about, you know, we have this internal leadership development group. Kirk's helped us with that. Kyle, uh, my assistant's helped us with that. And uh, I think it's been quite successful, and I was delighted when Student Affairs grabbed on that and said, hey, well, we should work this into our training with students. So we've done that. I didn't want to just rehash that, though it sounds like maybe I could have, and you wouldn't have known. Uh, so <laughs> uh, I want to do something a little bit different. And uh, this is uh, something I've done before. Um, before I came to UVU, I was a professor of political science, and my work within political science kind of sits on the boundaries of history and philosophy, um, and, and in particular looking at American political thought. What, what should government be doing? How should it act as opposed to how does it act? You know, that's an empirical question. You know, how do parties form? How do people win elections? That's a, a kind of a question of fact. How do things work? I was always more interested in the nor what we call the normative questions, the value questions. How should things work? How, how should politicians behave? What policies should we have from a perspective of justice or equity or liberty? And, uh, and so answering that 
both historically and normatively was, was kind of what I did before I came to UVU. I did it as a faculty member. And out of that came to me some, I think, some insights as I was reading about some of these great American founders about leadership principles that to me seemed sort of transcendent, if you will. That's a big fancy word and uh, uh, it, it may, may seem overblown, but I think it's not. It, what it means simply to say is that there are these ideas about leadership that transcend time and space. They worked for George Washington, they worked for Thomas Jefferson, they'll work for you uh, in this day and age too. Uh, and they worked in the setting of politics and government, but I think they apply to student government and student affairs, and I think they all apply to civic society, and I think they apply to business practices, and I think they apply to educational leadership. So, um, some of these will be an echo of things that we talked about before. They all, in one way or another, line up with some of those core competencies we talked about for leadership, but they're, you know, set a little bit different, and for me, they become memorable because they're tied to these great moments of our founding. So this is a way both to talk about leadership and hopefully in a way that can speak to you and be meaningful, but also in a way that is uh, educational and instructive about our past uh, as, uh, as a country. So, um, what I want to do, <laughs> great visionaries, these uh, founders. Uh, they could see into the future. You just didn't know how visionary were till you see this kind of thing on screen. Uh, I think he was actually there Thursday night on the floor mixing it up with New Mexico State. So, uh, 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 anyway, I do. Uh, I want to start uh, with uh, uh, actually Thomas Jefferson. Here's the here's the first principle. We'll go through these principles, give you some examples, and then. Uh, and then we'll wrap it up and take some questions about this, and then about anything else you want to talk about, leadership, university, uh, whatever. So principle number one, develop animating ideas. Okay? Uh, if you're going to be a leader, you've got to be about something. Okay? And that something should be more than, I want to be a leader, or I want to be famous or I want to have power. Uh, now, some level of those might be animating ideas for uh, the individual, but they're not going to be very persuasive to other people. So you need to kind of be about something, all right? And boy, if there was ever a moment in history when leaders were about something, it was the American founding. Uh, let me just say uh, a word about that. Here's John Adams. But what do we mean by the American Revolution? Do we mean the American War? The Revolution was effected before the war commenced. The Revolution was in the minds and the hearts of the people. So part of the reason the American Revolution was successful, the war was successful, is because behind the war, driving the war, surrounding the war, was a set of very compelling ideas, animating ideas that gave inspiration, that gave direction. And so that's, in many ways, I think the starting point for leadership. Here was the single best collection of the animating ideas of the American Revolution, the famous Declaration of Independence. It's going to be you know, more than decades later before we get the Constitution. Uh, undoubtedly there were other documents, but this is really the thing that sort of coalesced the colonies together. Now, what, you, what we so often forget is we, we live in this world where, uh, where we just kind of take the United States of America for granted. Like, oh yeah, sure, that was where this was all headed. That is not where it was headed. These were basically 13 independent almost countries that could have very easily gone a, a different direction of forming these autonomous states that, you know, now had to somehow live together in this landmass like Europe does. Uh, and it took this very different uh, tack, and it was based on this idea. We hold these truths to be self-evident. 
that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. One of the most memorable lines in all of American political thought, frankly, political thought anywhere. So let me just open it up for a second. What, what to you, okay, well this is a little bit of a spin now, we're moving off of leadership, but what, uh, what's, what's compelling to you about those statements? Anybody? Yeah. 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 Um, not to make it like too personal or personal. Yeah. Um, but in the one of our very first founding documents, it says that all men are created equal. So even though we're taking a specific deal, that we had a foundation in our country before we even started to recognize that it's okay. Good. Very nice. Very nicely stated. A uh, couple, couple things I, I hear going on there. Uh, first of all, you know, animating ideas are not necessarily ideas that everybody else has. That was part of the power of this. No, maybe not. This isn't how necessarily the whole world does believe this, but we believe it. We're convinced of it, and we're convinced that it's true. Okay? It also helps if these animating ideas of yours are true or valid or something more than, again, you know, something that's dishonest or self serving. Uh, so uh, that's good. Any any other comments about uh, about the statement? Yeah. I just appreciate the clarity and the simplicity of it. This statement is that everything else that is done after this is based upon making sure that this is the ruling policy of what should should happen. Okay. So the other is all simplicity, but that happened, and that's how it is. So uh, that doesn't give the defendant some other deal. So it's today. Bingo. Very nice. Well, I didn't say. Leadership is about ideas, did I? I said it's about animating ideas. I take that your point to underscore that. This is an animating idea, meaning it animates everything else. The Constitution comes later as a practical expression of this one paragraph idea. So there's a whole ton of stuff that comes about if you get that core theme, that core animating idea that can give life to everything else. You get a couple of those going for you, you can really move. Okay? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, very nice. That's a, that's a key component of what they're saying here is not just that it's true, uh, but it's true in such a way that it, it's not revocable. You know, you can't, you can't take it away, and that had a certain power for it, to it. Uh, I will tell you there's a big uh, linguistic debate about that term, unalienable. When Jefferson first wrote it in his rough draft, it was inalienable, I-N. When it came back from the printer, it was unalienable. Since then... Pointy-headed academics have been arguing ever since about which it should be, inalienable, unalienable. This is what we academics do for a living. <laughs> Fortunately, this was recently solved, this long, vexing controversy, by the reigning master of the English language, George W. Bush, <laughs> who in a public setting in Europe referred to our unalienable rights. So uh, you can use that at a cocktail party when you need to. So, okay. Okay. Uh, any other thoughts? Yeah, one more. Very nice. Words matter, okay? Uh, a right to happiness is different than the right to the pursuit of happiness. They were very careful, and again, because it was tied to certain ideas. There's certain presumptions here about freedom and the role of government, and so 
there's, it's, not just a, it's not just a view about equality here. There, there are other things that are tied into this really powerful kind of animating central core. Uh, here's here's uh, Lincoln. This kind of gets to the point earlier about, you know, well, wh what do you do about there was racism, there was slavery, and even some of the very founders who signed the documents had slaves. But again, you've got to kind of keep things in context. Here's, I've always appreciated this from Lincoln. All honor to Jefferson, to the man who in the concrete pressure of a struggle for national independence by a single pe people had the coolness, forecast, and capacity to introduce into a merely revolutionary document an abstract truth. You might rephrase that as an animating idea. In this case, that wouldn't be an improvement to the prose, but uh, that's the point. Applicable to all men at all times, and so to a balm it there that today and in all coming days it shall be a rebuke and a stumbling block to the very harbingers of reappearing tyranny and oppression. So I like this statement for, again, a couple of reasons. He, he's, he's acknowledging founding, founders were not perfect. Uh, they didn't live up to their ideals completely. But the guy who did more than anything else to eradicate slavery in this country takes us back to that animating idea moment and takes us back to, to Jefferson and highlights, by the way, how difficult it is. I, I think this, this, this line here is important. To the man who in the concrete pressure of a struggle for national independence. As a leader, you're a busy person. Every day, there are a hundred things flying at you that you've got to deal with that are very practical and you kind of have to get it done or bad things happen. And so there's always this constant pressure to just be doing the practical. The merely practical would be another way to say that if we're comparing it to our day. And what he said is, good for Jefferson, who took a, mi a moment in the middle of all this pressure of how you're going to you know, fund the troops and who's going to lead the army and what kind of taxation policy are we going to have and a thousand other things that have to get worked out to just stop and think and articulate a big animating idea like that that then has power for generations to come. Okay? All right. Principle number two. So you've got these big animating ideas. You've got to get the word out. Now you may say, well, the Declaration is another great example of it. It is. Uh, but um, it wasn't the only, and in some ways it wasn't even the most significant uh, document, at least at first, for getting the word out. So you... You may, want, you may have the world's greatest idea, and you may have the world's greatest document, uh, and some people might argue, it, may, may argue that about the Declaration, but one idea, one argument, one venue is not enough. You've got to find other ways to articulate, to get your message out, to communicate. And so here we look at someone like Thomas Paine. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about Thomas Paine. Um, in 1775, before the Declaration, in 1776, he starts to write this pamphlet called Common Sense uh, about uh, the American colonies. And uh, he starts it in 75, publishes it in January of 1776, six months ahead of the Declaration of Independence. He calls for a Declaration of Independence and sells 500,000 copies of that pamphlet, okay? Now, that may not sound a lot to you, like a lot to you, but compared to the population of this day, this was infinitely more popular than anything you know today, including those silly vampire novels you all read, okay? <laughs> okay. This was monumentally successful, and it's what helped drive this move to a, uh, to a, constitu a, a, a Continental Congress that then did formally declare independence. So um, that's not the only thing he wrote. He then wrote American Crisis. This is as the war began, and he could see what a difficult time it was, and so he put pen to paper and wrote some of the most stirring words about what that movement was, 
uh, some of them so stirring that George Washington, when he read them, was moved and had them read to the troops. And so, let me, I think I've got a little clip here uh, of one of my favorite passages from uh, American Crisis. writer whose pamphlet Common Sense had convinced many Americans to embrace independence. On a drumhead, he writes one of the most quoted essays in the English language. It is called The American Crisis. Washington immediately orders all of his officers to read it to their troops. He hopes its words will inspire them to hold on for just a little longer. These are the times that try men's soul. A summer soldier and a sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of their country. But they that stand in now deserve the love and thanks of men and women. Tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. But the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. Heaven knows how to put a proper price on its goods. It would be strange indeed if so celestial an article as freedom should not be highly rated. I fear nothing. I see no cause of fear. In the end, we will be the victor. <coughs> For though the flame of liberty may sometimes cease to shine, the ember will never expire. Okay. Um... Let's take a minute here for another little discussion uh, to have you help me tease out in terms of this principle of getting the word out. What, what do you think, either from watching that, listening to that, the Tom Paine example itself, or just things you might think of yourself, what are some things you might want to develop as a leader in order to get the word out, to be someone who can, who can do that? What, what, what might you want to do? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, compare that to, uh, all right, guys, the British are here. Go get them. <laughs> all right. There was power in that. Why? Why, Why was there power in that? Yeah. Okay. He was a poet. Okay. Uh, a poet with a purpose, so to speak. Um, so here's, here's one thought for you, something I did myself. I, uh, I was effectively a double major in English in college. Now, I'm not saying you should all rush out and do that necessarily, but I will tell you this, that English was not my sort of naturally favorite subject. I didn't just do it for the love of it. I did it in part because I wanted to become a better communicator. So you don't have to double major in English, but if I were you, I would get in the habit of reading great books, reading poetry, reading people who write well, listening to people who give good speeches. The other thing I do is I keep in my car and on my uh, iPod, you know, some of those, you can find them in different places, you know, world's greatest speeches. Listen to Winston Churchill. Listen to Ronald Reagan, listen to FDR, listen to John Kennedy, their cadence, their word choice, how are they doing it? Uh, those things, I believe, have an effect. I've certainly lived my life with that presumption and I, I think it's made a, a difference in my ability uh, to communicate and it's something I'm not saying I'm great at, I'm still working on it, but I would recommend to you uh, uh, you know, working on your powers of expression by learning from the best writers, the best speakers that are out there. Uh, any other thoughts about getting the word out? How else, besides just being able to kind of think of the right words, what else might you, might you do or think about? Yeah.
Yeah. And so sometimes as leaders, we sometimes focus on the battle at hand when we're still trying to appreciate how many we get to draw. Good, good. So in other words, I mean, if I can restate that, make sure you connect principle two with principle one. You know, if, if sometimes getting principle one right helps take care of principle two. You get the right ideas, sometimes they kind of start to speak for themselves. Uh, and it often goes back and forth. In, in you, you might have the idea, and then you start to talk about it, and you realize you're talking about I'm not sure I got it quite right. So you rethink the idea. And there's this back and forth. Uh, you know, and if, to use a fancy philosophical term, it's a dialectic between ideas and their expression. And you kind of keep working those back and forth off each other till you really refine something that's a great idea that's very nicely articulated. So, good. Any, yeah? We people, you can't become the CEO on your own. Okay. There, there are poets and presidents of rich men who have died in poverty and found their way to later in life. And, but yeah. They were not able to spread this great message all their life just because they were, they were too impulsive. They knew they had something great, but they were afraid to share it. Okay. So, good. Uh, you know, as a leader, uh, you know, if Thomas Jefferson were the only one to talk about this, how, how far would it go? You've got to, you know, you get a Thomas Paine, you get Patrick Henry, you get other people, you know, voicing these opinions. You know, as a leader, you, you try to find those who can help you articulate the mission, the vision, the value. You can't be there at all times yourself. You've got to have others around you uh, who are who are also, you know, communicating this way? Any other th any other thoughts on that? Yeah, one more. I think also you know the time it takes to think about all the things you wrote. Like there's no way you wrote that in one one night. Yeah. And so to be constantly be thinking about life and looking for the right answers. You learn the greatest things by our generation. You get a greatest guidance. You get greatest not being um, thinking you know what the right thing is. And just finding time to sit down to look at your your book. Yeah. Good. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, one more. I lied. <laughs> Truly, one more. Uh, I was just going. I wanted to say. I think journal writing is also a very important aspect of this because uh, writing down all the things that you're learning and any information you may have while you're doing it in a journal really makes it easy to write and makes it easy to take notes and think about it also. Yeah. Well, I certainly think if we think about it in terms of this dialectic idea about refining your ideas in order to articulate them, uh, that, makes, uh, that makes a lot of sense. My focus has been here a little bit more about getting word out. I'd, I'd love to publish your journal if you'd let me, uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm sure it's very, uh, very intelligent. Uh, so I, I absolutely underscore the utility of that in terms of refining your thinking. Uh, but in terms of getting uh, message out, the other thing that you guys know a lot more about than I do, though the fact I do have a Twitter account, but it is the whole social media thing. I mean, really figuring out how the world of communication is changing rapidly every day and figuring out how to either channel that or take advantage of that. Uh, that's going to be a real, I think, core competency for any leader uh, moving forward. Uh, so in addition to the words, you've got to think about the, the mechanisms, the venues, the different venues you can use. You know, when should you put something in the newspaper? When should you tweet something? When do you need a poster? When do you, you know, and do you use all of them? You know, and you have to make those decisions because rarely can you do all of them. You usually have a limited budget. You only have so much, you know, personnel, and you've got to find the most effective way to get your message out uh, more broadly. So, all right, principle three. Um, take a concrete stand. This is, uh, I think, a lesson too few, you know, talented young people who want to be leaders uh, uh, understand, um, especially at this stage of life when you're looking to kind of rise and climb. Um, you want to, you sort of want to try to please people. And that's not a bad thing, uh, you know, pleasing people, winning people over to your, you know, to, to, you know, getting them to trust you is an important thing to do. So I'm not saying you should be combative. I'm not saying you should be antagonistic. But I am saying there can be real power when with wisdom and judgment you take a stand, even if it's unpopular. Even if it's, you know, you're sort of the one person on the council or 
or the one person in the room in the meeting who sees it a little differently. Uh, you know, you, you wouldn't want to be that person all the time, but occasionally, you know, taking a stand on those things can, can, uh, can make a difference. And often times leadership is about taking stand because moments of leadership often revolve around contested positions where it's not exactly clear to anybody what to do. And, and so it's an act of leadership that says, look, there are good arguments on both sides, but folks, here's what I think we need to do. My favorite example on this comes from the life of John Adams. Um, so uh, John Adams, I think, is the most underappreciated member of the founding generation, but he was a tremendous figure. Um, and it started, in many respects, with him uh, defending British soldiers uh, at, the, uh, at, at the Boston Massacre. So these British soldiers are defending this little uh, place in the center of Boston, and some local teenagers basically kind of start a snow, what looked like maybe a snowball fight, but then begins to escalate, and they start throwing chunks of ice at these soldiers and get more and more aggressive and finally come up to them, and these soldiers fire. And in the process, they kill some of these young people and then others who come to their defense. And the place is already a tinderbox. And it sort of explodes. Uh, and people want justice. They want these soldiers condemned. And John Adams, cousin of Samuel Adams, a prominent revolutionary himself, uh, says, well, we can't have that. Uh, we've got to, you know, these soldiers deserve a fair trial. And um, so I'll come back, uh, uh, well, in, in any case. Um, uh, so he decides to uh, represent them. And it was a very unpopular thing to do. But you know what it did? Is it bought an immense amount of credibility for the American Revolution by not only people in America, but by a lot of people in England. They're like, for the first time they said, oh, these guys aren't just rabble-rousers. These are people who believe in the rule of law and that everyone's entitled to representation. And he did such a good job that the soldiers got off. Now, again, if, if you were just animated by, your, uh, by just the one kind of end of liberty, you might say, I'm not going to do that. But he said, there's a principle at stake here, and I'm going to take a stand for it. And I may lose some of my support, some of my friends, but in the end, what he did is gain some credibility for himself. And he went on to become later what was called the Atlas of Independence. Uh, he was an effective organizer, uh, really good at the kind of the legislative stuff, sat on more committees than any other founding father. He was a towering intellect. I mean, really a smart, smart guy. So, you know, I told you about common sense. And, uh, and Thomas Paine and all that, that the impact it had. Uh, John Adams said of that, he thought it was a poor, ignorant, malicious, short-sighted, crapulous mass. <laughs> I wish he'd told us what he really thought of, uh, of Thomas Paine. Now again, he, there are lots of, lots of reasons for that, but this was no, no dummy. And uh, anyway, he used that uh, intellect to great effect, and it kind of started with that moment of taking a stand. So um, I wanted to, that's all a setup to tell you that um, when it came right down to it, it was not clear that uh, we should even declare independence. There were a lot of people, a lot of good, solid American colonists, even patriots who said, this is crazy. Why would we break ourselves off from England? The world's military superpower, where our families live, where our heritage comes from, our key trading partner. This is insanity. And again, there's this back and forth, and at some point, someone has to take a stand. And John Adams was practiced for that, and this is, a, I think, one of the more powerful and underappreciated moments of that move for independence, when he stands up, when there's sort of indecision, and carries the day. Continental Congress faced the great question of the day. Should the colonies declare independence and abandon any hope for peace and reconciliation with Britain? With the
doors locked against spies, the opposition spoke first. John Dickinson pleaded with the delegates not to make a terrible mistake. Dickinson said to declare independence now would be to launch our fortunes into the storm in a skiff made of paper. Point being, this is just a piece of paper, this declaration, and don't do it now. It's too dangerous. Let's find out first whether we can win, or let's find out if they're willing to have a reconciliation. We don't have to go through the bloodbath. A long silence followed Dickinson's address. Finally, John Adams took the floor. Objects of the most stupendous magnitude are now before us. We are in the very midst of revolution. The most complete, unexpected, and remarkable of any in the history of the world. Outside, the sky darkened. The clouds unleashed a summer downpour. Adams had once written that such storms unstrung him. Now, he pressed on, making the case for independence. From England, we hear nothing but war and revenge. What pains and expense and misery that stupid people will endure for the sake of driving the colonies to the necessity of separation. The majority must govern, he argued, and the insolent domination of the highborn in London be thrown off. The decree is gone forth and cannot be recalled that a more equal liberty that has prevailed in other parts of the earth must be established in America. Independence was a military necessity. America could not win without foreign assistance, and it could not get foreign assistance without first declaring independence. If you imagine that I expect this declaration to ward off calamities from this country that much was taken. A bloody conflict we are destined to endure. That has been my opinion from the beginning. It is your hard lot and mine to have been called into life at such a time, but even these times have their pleasures. May heaven prosper the newborn republic and make it more glorious than any former republic has been. to whom the country is most indebted for the great measure of independency is Mr. John Adams of Boston. One delegate wrote, I call him the Atlas of American Independence. With this speech, Adams put his life on the line. Agents of the Crown were drawing up a list of those rebels to be pardoned. John Adams was not on it. He was to hang. Okay, take a stand. Hopefully you won't have to do one that puts your life in jeopardy, but you might. Uh, and sometimes that's what it means to be a leader and uh, something well worth remembering. Uh, principle four, analyze and act. Uh, these last two principles are, uh, uh, principle four and five, uh, are uh, from the most important founder, George Washington. By analyze and act, um, you know, the thing that I think is most important about George Washington was his ability to take uh, hard analysis and turn it into practical action, okay? That's a hard thing to do in and of itself. There are a lot of people who can do hard analysis and there are a lot of people who can take action, make things happen. This is really hard to put it together. And he did it. And in a nutshell, what he did is he looked at the, the uh, situation he was facing. And he kind of stepped back and said, I'm not going to be bound by tradition. I'm not going to be bound by the voices around me. I'm just going to think really hard about the situation I'm, figure, I'm facing and figure out what it's going to take to win, and then I'm going to do it. And what his analysis led him to conclude was this, that he could not do 
the traditional thing with respect to military engagement. Back in the day, military engagement was all about formal confrontation and sort of bravery and bravado. So you would, you would kind of play these, you know, you would meet up at a place and you'd have these gentlemen's agreements about, you know, where you would fight and all that. And, uh, and then you'd kind of try to make a name for yourself if you could, like a Napoleon or someone, by daring someone, luring someone uh, into uh, a, a great battle and take them on head on and whatnot. He just knew there's no way I'm going to win that war. Britain is too strong with its army, too strong with its navy. So the only hope I have is to lead a series of retreats. Now this doesn't sound very brave. This wasn't going to win him any laurels. And in fact, it won him a lot of criticism. He said, the only way I'm going to beat these guys is to stay in the game long enough that they either wear out or make a mistake. Because head-to-head, -head, battle, battle, man for man, strategy for strategy, I'm going to be beat eight times out of ten, and pretty soon I won't have an army. And so he went into these series of strategic retreats where he'd come up, engage, and then retreat by design, and then make the British run after him. And he kept doing this for years. And they were wearing out, and it was wearing down support in England until finally they did make a mistake and got their whole army more or less bottled up in Yorktown. And then he had them surrounded. Well, that was analyzing and then acting on that analysis uh, that we've all got to do in our leadership positions to make things work effectively. And then fifth and finally, uh, and my, in some ways my greatest hope for you is Utah Valley Wolverines. Uh, is if you do get into positions of leadership, and many of you are by nature of this course or student government or other things, don't abuse those privileges. Don't abuse power uh, for your selfish ends or even sometimes for not so selfish ends. Be respectful that power has to be treated carefully. And if you have power, you I believe you are under an ethical obligation to treat power carefully. And here again, no better example than uh, George Washington. Uh, the war gets so bad in 1776 that the Continental Congress basically has to give Washington near dictatorial powers. Now this was a big concern because the whole reason they were fighting is because they were tired of the tyranny of King George. But they realized there's something powerful about a tyrant. They can make quick, effective decisions. And in a military, that's sometimes what you need. And things got so bad, they basically said, uh, we're going to give you near dictatorial powers, but we're so glad we can do that because we trust you that you won't abuse that. And that's their statement. And here's his response. Instead of thinking myself freed from all civil obligations by this mark of their confidence, I shall constantly bear in mind that as the sword was the last sort resort for the preservation of our liberties, so it ought to be the first thing laid aside when those liberties are firmly established. He, they said, we can trust you. He said, I'm, flat, I'm honored by that and you can trust me. Um, I'll lead by the sword right now, but when those liberties are secured, I'll step aside. And that's exactly what he did. And the most dramatic moment of that came uh, in a place called Newburgh, Pennsylvania. This was after the war, basically, kind of waiting for the, the peace treaty to be signed. And the Continental Congress had not been paid. Here these men were. They fought long and hard. Many of them re-enlisted under promise of payment. And because we don't have the Constitution in place yet, we don't have a way to really collect taxes from all the states uh, or colonies that were becoming states. And as a result, there wasn't enough money. And so these soldiers were ticked off. And frankly, they had a right to be ticked off. They were owed this money. So as a matter of pure justice, they were entitled probably to do something about it. But what they wanted to do was march and take over the government. 
so that they could get their just due. And what Washington understood is that while at some level they were entitled to that, at another level that would be a disaster. It would be opposed to everything they had fought for. And so here's what he does when he gets wind that some of his senior most officers are meeting, men he's led, men who love him, men who are inspired, but men who are fed up now and want to do something different than what he thinks needs to happen, uh, lest it become an abuse of power. spectacles for I have not only grown gray but almost blind in service of my country. My dear gentlemen, Well, pretty moving stuff, at least it is uh, for me. With that little speech, he turned the tide. Those men who were ready to march on Philadelphia stood down and realized kind of the error of their ways. A lot of the first-hand reports of this suggest that the really the turning point was when he pulled out those glasses and gave that famous statement of not only growing old, but... Uh, blind in the service of, gray, but blind in the service of his country. What was powerful about that moment is that it was a physical representation in a most memorable way of something they probably already knew but needed to be reminded of, which is that George Washington wasn't in this just for George Washington. He was suffering with them. He was paying the price with them, and he was doing it for something larger than himself some larger good. 
And so how could they abuse power if he of all uh, would not do it and he led the way? And so as a leader, as a Utah Valley University Wolverine, as someone who I hope will choose to be ethical in their practice of leadership throughout all the rest of their lives, I hope you'll remember that moment as a kind of a lodestar for you to say, when I'm in a position of power, influence, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fight, I'm going to articulate, I'm going to push for things, but I'm going to make sure that it's not about me and it's not about using my position of privilege to advance things that just work for me that don't work for other people. Or that you do it in a way that works responsibly for all involved. So, anyway... A lot more that we could uh, talk about um, uh, with that great uh, revolutionary generation. But with that, we just have a few minutes left. So let me open up to questions about anything I've said here. Founding, leadership, UVU, uh, life of a president, whatever you want to talk about. What's, uh, what's on your mind? Pointing, yes. Yeah. 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 Well, that's that's the that's the perennial question. That's the question I deal with every day of my life in this job. Is when when do you compromise and when do you hold your ground? And uh, uh, there, you know, there's really no magic formula. I wish I could. I wish I could uh, tell you that. But the fact that you're asking the question says you're on the right path. There, there are too many leaders who are too willing to compromise too often. And there are still other leaders who just sort of almost pride themselves on never compromising. And, and maybe in some circumstances that's the right kind of leader for a certain project. And maybe in other circumstances, you know, uh, you, need a, you need a compromiser. And it, and it does depend on the position that you hold and the nature of the environment that you're in. So there are a lot of variables at play here. But I, I guess my core conviction about this is that more often than not, our best leaders are those that have a kind of a blended commitment there, who, who have positions, who have convictions, who want to see things get done, and who are willing to take bold stands and strong stands, but who recognize in the world in which we live very rarely can you get exactly what you want. You have to get there with other people, other parties, and that's probably going to mean some compromise and some adjustment and listening. And often what can happen is it doesn't require compromise so much as listening to people. It is, to quote the late, great Steve Covey, uh, you seek for a win-win where neither side is compromising, but you find a third alternative where both parties feel like they really got what they wanted out of it. So... Just keep asking yourself those questions and pushing yourself to, to, to work on both. And if you feel like you tend to be a little more combative and it's my way or the highway, then maybe you want to work on the compromise thing. Or if you're one of those always trying to please people and make sure everyone's happy, maybe you need to work on, you know, kind of pushing yourself to take some stands and to be out there a little bit more and stake a claim on something and argue for it. So, good question. Other, uh, other thoughts, questions? Yeah. Yeah. When you've done this in the past and the result ended up being basically a wrong choice. Yeah. What do you do in that situation? Well, first of all, I think failure is often a good sign of leadership because it means you're trying stuff. Nobody in here is so perfect and so brilliant, you're going to get the answer right every time. And sometimes one of the things that I see that, that sort of hamstring leaders is that they're so worried they're going to get it wrong that they don't act. And so, uh, yeah, I've analyzed and I've acted and stuff has gone wrong or badly. And the first thing you do is don't get immobilized by that and think, oh, I'm not a leader or I can't do it. The first thing you say is, okay, I learned something from that. So how do I, what do I learn from it? How does it change the analysis? What new piece of information did I get? What variable did I miss? And just go recalculate. So... 
Failure's got to be part of your equation. You gotta, leaders have to get comfortable with being, being willing to fail, or you're going to be too timid and, and not, not achieve everything that you could achieve. So uh, that's, that's something you've got to kind of keep thinking about. Um, other questions? Yeah. <laughs> I love that question. <laughs> Sounds like there's something very specific in mind there, but I won't push you to reveal it right now. Uh, um, well, yes and no. I mean, let's be honest. Um, there are sometimes, especially in you know big organizations, especially in like political organizations, where you can't quite come out and say something. There's something about decorum or whatever that just it just wouldn't be, but. Do you go set to a reporter and say, hey, you know, uh, I just thought I should tell you my boss is, and your boss knows he's doing it, next thing you know it shows up in the papers. And Do I think that's unethical? Well, not if that's what your boss wants you to do and the reporter's just doing his job. You know, that's, that's, that would be one example. Uh, where you have to be really careful is if you're, if you're manipulating an individual, if you're using them in some unwitting way to your advantage and it runs counter to their advantage. So I'd be, I'd be pretty cautious about that without being, you know, a Puritan about it to say, no, there's, there's, there's no scenario which that would ever be appropriate. There are kind of, you know, sometimes where it, where it might work, but you'd want to be very careful and make sure that, you know, as much as possible, you're going through the front door, you're, you're saying things straightforward, you're working with people who, you know, know, know what they're doing, so say. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. When life is a present, you know, we've been talking about how it's you know, you're really busy and stuff. So yeah. As leaders and, and as work continues to catch up, what would be the best advice that you could give us on how to keep the balance? Yeah. Well, that's a great question. I remember uh, one of my f the favorite pieces of advice or response I heard to a question like that posed when I was not too much older than you guys. I was out of college. I was working back in Boston. And... Um, I uh, was in a, 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 an ecclesiastical setting where Mitt Romney was a leader. So you won't have to guess too hard what the ecclesiastical setting was there for some of you. but uh, So Mitt Romney was um, the uh, CEO of uh, Bain Capital, and he was an LDS stake president, and he was the father of five sons. Uh, and... All this, you know, kind of at the age of uh, 40 or whatnot. And so it's this kind of uh, LDS stake setting where someone asked him, said, well, you know, President Romney, uh, that's uh, speaking of balance, we'll take care of that later. Uh, so um, the, uh, they said, how, you know, how do you keep balance in your life? And he said, well, I don't know anything about balance. I just know that when my partner's in Bain, my counselors in my LDS stake presidency and my wife are all equally mad at me. I'm doing it about right. <laughs> so, uh, sort of a more pessimistic way of looking at it. But there's, uh, there are days when I feel like that. It's like I cannot please everybody, you know, truly. Uh, and those are, those are hard moments, you know. I'm, I'm not at a, at a kid's baseball game uh, or I'm not at the... UVU Symphony uh, concert, or I'm not uh, at this event a donor has invited me to, uh, or uh, on a vacation I gotta I gotta take just carve out a little bit of time to go see someone when my family would rather do anything else. So the important thing is to to really do make sure that you don't uh, let your leader professional demands overwhelm the other demands of your life. If I let it, and it would be so easy to, I could let this job consume my life entirely to the exclusion of diminishing my marriage, diminishing my relationship with my children, diminishing my personal health. Every day I, I feel such intense pulls on my time about I should be to this part of the university, I should be to that part of the community. And, and there are a lot of jobs like that. And life is getting more competitive and more demanding. And so um, I, m the only way I've been able to, to negotiate it is to ask of myself and everyone around me to simultaneously make sacrifices. 
my wife and kids have sacrificed for me to do what I've done, no doubt. And I've asked it of them, and they've done it. But I also don't do that to such an extreme that they get entirely neglected. And so I ask sacrifices of my staff and of you students and of the athletic department and our arts folks to say, I'm just not going to be at everything. And there are going to be days where I'm going to say, you know what, I'm going to my daughter's volleyball tournament for a full day. And I'm not going to worry about email uh, or text messages because that's my girl and I've only got a few years left with her. So the important thing is just to relentlessly ask yourself that question to make sure that the priorities that can so easily be pushed out, which are often family, health, friendships, boy, I wouldn't give those up for any amount of professional success or organizational accomplishment in the world. So We're probably out of time. Any other, any other questions? I think that's probably a good one to end on. Uh, thank you. You're terrific students. You're the creme de la creme. Keep it up. You're on to great things. And keep asking these great questions, studying these great insights. And you're on your way to make a great contribution. So thank you very much. <laughs>